now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. 706, it's Memorial Day, and we are proud and grateful to be here live for you this Monday morning in the nation's capital and internally grateful for our ability to exercise our First Amendment rights, all of our constitutional rights right here on this program and on a day-to-day basis because of that ultimate sacrifice made by, by so many wearing our uniform. Thank you. We can't say enough. And we're going to continue our Memorial Day observances as the morning goes on. At 7.35, the Chief of Staff of the Honor Flight Network, Marion Watkins. At 8.05, presidential historian and author Jane Hampton Cook. And then at 8.35, this is the 20th anniversary of the World War II Memorial. We'll discuss it with the spokesperson, Alex Kershaw. I'm Larry O'Connor, along with an additionally grateful Julie Gunlock. Good morning. Good morning, Julie. I just decided to say you're grateful, because you are. <laughs> I, I know I you am. say so. Also joining us, Joe DeGeneva, man who uh, exercises the... Uh, the duty to protect people's civil rights in the court of law. Uh, of course, he's a legal analyst and former U.S. attorney of the District of Columbia. I, I could be wrong, Joe. Uh, first of all, good morning. Uh, good Memorial Day to you. Thanks for being here. Uh, delighted to be with you. And we uh, spend a lot of this day honoring the dead, uh, the great men and women who died in service to our country throughout many wars. And we say God bless them. Amen. You know, Joe, earlier I discussed um, this latest development in the special classified documents case, the special counsel case against Donald Trump, where, you know, so many of the rights in our uh, our criminal justice system is set up so that the accused have a certain number of rights that are protected by the system. It's so that the, the power of the federal government cannot come down on them like a ton of bricks. Uh, This was crafted in such a way to protect those rights of the criminals or the accused uh, so that a tyrannical government can't force its will on the accused, on an innocent person. So that brings us to two developments last week, both having to do with the classified documents case. And I'd love for you to just go off on them both. First, the discovery that the raid on President Trump's home included language that allowed the FBI to use lethal force if necessary. This is a warrant that Merrick Garland personally signed off on, and we're told, oh, that's just boilerplate standard operating procedure. I'd love for you to comment on that. And then secondly, Jack Smith's attempt to gag Donald Trump because he actually, again, the accused, spoke out and reacted to the fact that his child and his wife was in danger during that raid. Go ahead, Joe. Tell me how I'm wrong that this is outrageous. Well, what's fascinating about this is it presents an opportunity. Uh, Jack Smith uh, has done nothing but overreach <clears throat> since he started these two cases that he has brought, one in Washington and one in Fort Pierce, Florida, outside of Miami. Um, this is an opportunity for Judge Eileen Cannon, who is overseeing this case, to hold a hearing about all of this on the deadly force question in the warrant, but more importantly, on the gag order. Uh, The gag order presents a marvelous opportunity to take testimony from FBI agents because Jack Smith claimed in his motion to impose a gag order on President Trump that President Trump, by discussing the warrant and the execution of the warrant at Mar-a-Lago, that President Trump is endangering the lives of agents and people in charge of the case. He's given absolutely no evidence whatsoever for that. And what's happening is Jack Smith is losing the public debate over his own cases, and he doesn't like it. Mm. And so what he's trying to do is even further silence President Trump by claiming that he cannot talk about a public matter, the search of Mar-a-Lago, which Jack Smith made sure everybody knew about because he or someone in his instruction called various television and radio networks just like they did in other instances and had cameras there so they could observe everything. The deadly force issue in this warrant is a legitimate question. First of all, there never should have been a search of Mar-a-Lago. We begin with that. Without the search, none of this even is an issue. This could have all been settled by a visit with people, um, FBI agents plus DOJ personnel and the president's lawyers to walk through every part of that facility as the DOJ had done on previous occasions. They had been to Mar-a-Lago. 
before and had walked through. So the question is, how do you get to the bottom of this? And the answer is, well, you hold a hearing. You put FBI agents on, on, uh, on the stand. And by the way, the deadly force order uh, was ordered by Merrick Garland, but I want to underscore the next point, and Christopher Ray. Notice how Christopher Ray disappears on anything related to this case, but it, when, when it involves possible terrorism coming across the southern border, he's everywhere screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. This is the, this is the classic Christopher Ray self-preservation mode, uh, the man in the gray flannel suit. Yeah. I mean, this guy is amazing. He's just amazing. And to watch Congress sort of grovel as he comes up there and lies through his teeth every time is amazing. The gag order on President Trump that Jack Smith seeks is absolutely unconstitutional. I do not believe that Judge Cannon will grant it, but I do believe, and I know she should hold a hearing and say, why do you want this? And by the way, while you're here explaining the gag order, I want to know who spread the documents on the floor during the search, put the false document covers, red and white sensitive information document covers on those sheets, took a picture of it, and gave it to the press, making it look like that's the way the documents were actually kept by the president, when in fact they were in boxes, deal yeah. boxes, in a facility that was protected by the Secret Service. I, I think Jack Smith has overreached, and if Eileen Cannon is smart, she'll hold a hearing, take sworn testimony from the FBI and DOJ personnel involved in the raid, in the raid and involved in that outrageous display of documents on the floor during the raid. You know, Joe, I, I, I hope this isn't too By the way, let me just say one more thing yeah. before I forget. Why did they do that with the documents on the floor? Why did they release that photo? One reason, to influence a potential yep. jury. And he has the gall to complain about the president, President Trump, objecting and discussing the raid of his own home. Joe, if you don't mind backing up a little bit, because I do think it's really instructive for people to understand, especially non-lawyers. I am not a lawyer. I've never been in a courtroom. Why are You're gag orders? <laughs> Why are gag orders? What is the reason that gag orders are are used? I I don't think I I think some people don't understand that this is really an abuse of that power of the judiciary to 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 gag defendants and and but but they can be used to protect people um, sort of from harming themselves. Can you kind of explain the good use or, or appropriate use of gag orders? Well, first of all, gag orders, that is restraints on litigants and people in cases are not favored in the law. They are not, they are not favored because what happens in a gag order? You tell people they cannot speak. Mm -hmm. And when a judge tells people they cannot speak, that is the government telling people they cannot speak. And the First Amendment says Congress shall make, low, make no law abridging freedom of speech. Well, that gag order is an abridgment of freedom of speech. And so they have to be narrowly tailored and only in rare circumstances. Jack Smith doesn't want it to be narrowly tailored. He wants the president, former president of the United States, who is the person that gag orders are designed to protect. Jack Smith isn't trying to protect Donald Trump. He's trying to protect himself from adverse publicity. The gag orders are designed to protect defendants, witnesses, other things, but they are a rarity. And the reason we don't have a lot of as we don't have a lot of examples of this is because judges don't want to do this because it is a rare and impermissible use of authority. Jack Smith is trying to protect himself. He's not trying to protect, and not from harm or from threats or from anything else. He's trying to protect himself from adverse publicity. And it's adverse publicity that he has cre created by his thuggish behavior. When they executed that search warrant at Mar-a-Lago with all those people with guns and weaponry yeah. and every conceivable sort of movie, third-rate movie film uh, ex search warrant exercise tactics, he created a purposeful, knowing event to garner publicity, to smear the president. And when they spread those pictures out on the floor, they did it to influence a potential jury. If you were to do a voir dire down in Florida and ask that when, if we get to that point, 
and ask people what, what, what did they know about this case, one of the first things they're going to say is they knew it because they saw that photograph of the document spread on the floor. In other words, the FBI created evidence. They didn't find evidence. They created evidence. And now Jack Smith wants to shut President Trump up about talking about it. This guy, Jack Smith, is the greatest threat to civil liberties that anybody could have ever conceived of. He is a Frankenstein monster of the law. We've got a little bit more with Joe DeGeneva, including the closing arguments in the Trump trial in New York, as well as the controversy over a patriotic historic flag flying in front of a Supreme Court justice's home. We're going to get to all of that with Joe. I'm not even going to ask him. It's a federal holiday. He has nothing else to do, so he's going to be with us. WMAL. Making sense of the news. Live. Live from the Home Paramount Pest Control Studios. Home Paramount, the leader in pest control since 1939. Miss anything? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Get today's breaking news on the Vince Colony Show weekdays 3 to 6 right here on WMAL. Joe, uh, you've been telling us from the beginning that Judge Mershon is the most powerful person in the courtroom uh, in the New York trial uh, related to a, a financial notation for a legal payment to Michael Cohen that Donald Trump is accused of falsifying and thus, I guess, uh, altering the course of the 2016 election, if you were to believe Alvin Bragg. Am I to believe now and understand that the jury instructions are not going to be made public? I assume that this is always a public process. Apparently, they're not going to be made public. And and, and by the way, as, as a matter of fascinating issue, again, New York law, the, the jury themselves will not be given a written copy of the instructions. They are not allowed to have copies of the jury instructions. They'll have to remember what the instructions are when the judge gives them. Oh my now, gosh. You can think of any stupid, more stupid rule than that. Uh, you know, I, 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 it's inconceivable to me that jurors would not be given a copy of the instructions, but that is the rule in New York. Jurors are not given a copy of the instructions. But let's, let's just be, let's just step back for a moment. I've been listening to all the chatter from the chattering class over the last few days about um, what the jury is going to do, what they're not going to do about hung juries and all this. Judge Mershon, who is a totally corrupt New York Democratic hack judge, is going to do what we call a directed verdict of guilty. He's not going to give them instructions that, that emphasize reasonable doubt. He's going to give them instructions that basically tell them to convict Donald Trump. He is go without doing it directly, he is going to give them a directed verdict of guilty. He's going to tell them that they must find Donald Trump guilty. And the reason he's going to do that is he has taken away from the defense all of the arguments that they could have available about the what the Federal Election Commission law is and about a whole host of other issues that he has denied them the right to present evidence on and cross-examine government witnesses on. This case is fixed. It is over. Mm -hmm. This nonsense about a hung jury or an acquittal is idiotic. People are not being rational. This is a corrupt judge. This is Charles. This is Dickensian. Wow. You are watching something from the 18th century, 19th century. This is this is incredible. What you are watching. This is the most corrupt judicial proceeding in the history of the United States. And the reason it's so sad that there aren't cameras is we haven't had an opportunity to see this farcical magistrate, Dickensian magistrate on television so people could watch this fool, this absolute fool of a judge. And c congratulations, New York. Congratulations, Kathy Hochul, for displaying for the rest of the world that if you do business in New York, you're an idiot. Get the hell out of New York. Yeah. This is the kind of judiciary that the state of New York runs. Yeah, and it's happening right before our eyes, and it's affecting a presidential election as we speak. It's it's unbelievable, Purposely. Joe. Uh, one last question. The, election. the um the, the the flag. The the New York Times puts, you know, multiple reporters on a really important scandal <laughs> that Justice Alito flies a historic American flag outside of his home. Well, you know, the fascinating part about this is is that the New York Times, the Washington Post, by the way, I, I hope you saw the story about the horrific losses 
that the Washington Post has suffered tens of millions of dollars in losses and the laying off. uh, Apparently, Bezos is going to have to lay off even more people. I hope it continues to be a shadow of itself. The Post is a rag. It's not worth reading. And, of course, subscriptions are down dramatically, Uh, apparently a 30 percent drop in subscriptions. I think that's the percentage that we saw. The readers are smart. The readers are smart. The answer is a flag is a flag. And you make of it what you will. And the Post, the New York Times is just one strange group of ducks. They're nuts. And what they want to do is they want to they want to get Alito off the court. Well, Sen- Senator get- Whitehead wants to get into a, a whole, you know, a, a yes. Senate hearing over this. Yes, he, he wants to hold a hearing at his restricted country club uh, <laughs> where he comes from up in New England. That's uh, right. Where, you know, Jews were not allowed for a long time and no blacks and apparently still aren't, although he's presented no proof that there are any black or Jewish members. At any rate, That's bottom right. line is uh, the thing about the flag is a created controversy yep. designed. And this is where the Republicans and, and well-meaning Americans had better keep the House in the hands of the Republicans and give the Senate to Republicans, because if they don't, the first order of business will to, will be to impeach two Supreme Court justices. Yep. Thank you, Joe DeGeneva. Always an important and sobering conversation with you every Monday morning at 7. Thank you, sir. Remember the dead. God bless. Amen. Mm. Yeah, Senator Whitehead should have a special hearing at his beach club. Just, you know, he needs to tell Senator Cory Booker that he's not allowed to come. Right. That right, might be right. that. That'll be yeah. awkward. Eh. Oh, well. Now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. W-M-A-L. It's 737 on this Memorial Day. We are so happy that you're joining us on this important day. And we're happy to be live here for you, wherever you happen to be, wherever you're headed to make sure you uh, spend some time honoring the fallen who sacrificed everything for our freedoms, for our nation, for our security. Coming up to help us in that process at 805, presidential historian Jane Hampton Cook. And at 835, Alex Kershaw, he's a historian and spokesperson for the National World War II Memorial celebrating its 20th anniversary. I'm Larry O'Connor, ever grateful, alongside Julie Gunlock. Good morning, Julie. Good morning. Good morning. Joining us right now is Marion Watkins, Chief of Staff for the Honor Flight Network, a incredible organization that uh, does great work for our veterans. Uh, Marion, thank you for joining us. Happy Memorial Day to you. Thanks for having me. So correct me if I'm wrong, and I usually am wrong, so I really hope you correct me. I want to be right. But I remember the first time Honor Flights were on my radar uh, had to do with the World War II Memorial. When it first opened 20 years ago, uh, there were World War II veterans who had never been to Washington, D.C. and had no means to come here. And that's where the Honor Flight Network started. Is is that correct or did it happen even before then? No, that's right. You you, uh, hit the nail on the head there. That's uh, really how our organization was created, uh, was to honor the World War II generation uh, shortly after the dedication of the World War II Memorial. Um, and that has morphed over the years, obviously, with um, you know, that generation is, is sadly passing on. Uh, we still honor them. They're part of our mission. Uh, but our, uh, the population of veterans we honor has expanded to Korean War veterans uh, and largely Vietnam these days. So. Is that right? Yeah, my my um, grandfather-in-law was able to take an honor flight for the Korean War Memorial um, before he passed away, and it was I, I was able to accompany him on the tour, and it was so moving and so amazing. But it's there's there's so few, uh, certainly from World War II uh, veterans left, let alone the Korean War. It's it's incredible if you think about it. Absolutely, I think last year we. Uh... Boy, I think the total number of veterans we brought uh, from who are World War II veterans was under 400. Uh, the previous year it was about 800. So it's it's you know quickly diminishing, but um, obviously we're going to honor them as long as they're still around. So they're they're certainly a very part, a big part of our mission, and that's how we uh, began. And that's we never lose sight of that. That that's uh, kind of was the impetus for for honor flight in the first place was honoring that uh, the greatest generation. Um, and nowadays, I, I think, you know, certainly with the Vietnam generation, it, it resonates so differently for that population um, that it's, it's wonderful to be able to, to welcome them home, so to speak, after, you know, nearly 
50 years after they've returned to American soil. So, Marion, I'm, I'm curious about the volunteers that you get um, and sort of the demographic makeup of the volunteers um, that worked with your that work with your organization. Are they mostly uh, sort of Gen X or boomer age, or are you able to attract a younger generation? What's sort of the makeup of the, of the, um, of the volunteers? Well, we're very fortunate to have just a a wealth of volunteers um, and certainly in the DC region come out to the airports. Our loyal ground crew members are solely volunteer and they come out regularly to the three local airports to uh, make sure that our, our veterans are well taken care of when they arrive and are able to get out to their buses um, and tour guides, the whole nine yards. But, um, you know, that I think it really spans different generations. We've got young, you know, 20, 30 somethings coming out to the airports on a regular basis, uh, serving in these roles, you know, all the way up to retirees who still want to be engaged, who mm-hmm. still want to you know, make a difference. So, uh, and I'll, of course, it's wonderful when we have school groups come out to the airports yeah. or to the memorials. That's, that intergenerational um, interaction is really special. And I think for both uh, for both sides, the kids get a lot out of it. I've certainly brought my four kids out many times to greet veterans, and the veterans' faces just light up when they see mm. um, see kids. It's it's yeah. really heartwarming. So, yeah. what do you need right now if people want to get involved? Well, we'd love for everybody out there, your listeners, to visit honorflight.org. Um, we make it fairly clear what our schedule is, when the inc- incoming groups are coming into D.C. You can see when they'll be out at the memorials, uh, which airline they're coming in, uh, which particular airport they're landing at. Um, so it's uh, all there on our website, just okay. honorflight.org. Um, hit volunteer, and there are all sorts of opportunities for folks to get involved and we we really do welcome when we count on that um so we thank anybody and everybody out there who's listening who's been a part of our of our mission over the years well and anybody who's been to reagan airport when an honor flight comes in it's so cool the way you make such a big celebration at the airport and i gotta ask you though i mean i know when it was mostly world war ii and korean war veterans coming in you would have you would have women dressed up like, you know, it was the 40s and early 50s, sort of, uh, you know, uh, bringing back the era and play the music. In fact, our own Heather Hunter, our executive producer, used to volunteer and do that. And she'd get all glammed up in her, you know, Andrew's sister's look. Now that it's Vietnam War, does everyone come out dressed like hippies? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like handing out daisies and stuff, flowered children, tie-dye shirts, the whole thing? No. Not quite, not quite, <laughs> but we still do st- do have the swing dancers come out, so we're oh, great. Right. Um, See, when you start doing the Cold War era, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to dress like Duran Duran and Madonna at the airport. This is not going to be as nostalgic. Shoulder pads are going to come out. Right, back, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be a, a, a fool. Thank you, Mary <laughs> Marion Watkins. I appreciate it. And thank you for everything that the Honor Flight Network does. Seriously, it's so fantastic. It's really a labor of love for us. So okay. we um, honor our nation's heroes today and every day, certainly. So Amen to that. Thank you, Marion. It is 743. And uh, by the way, the most important holiday of the year after Memorial Day is right around the corner. As you know, Julie Gunlock, the International Criminal Court has issued warrants, arrest warrants, for the Prime Minister of Israel and the Defense Secretary of Israel. Israel, that would be Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. <laughs> uh, yeah, I that, apparently for war crimes in that nation's defense against Hamas terrorists who murdered and slaughtered and raped and still hold hostages. They're still holding hostages. They're still holding hostages. You know, I don't I, know. I, I feel like Germany might want to sit this one out. Oh, yeah. Right? So so that that's the, the latest news here. If I Let me jump into the Germany part of it. So the International Criminal Court offers these warrants for gen- for Israeli officials for their conduct in the war against Hamas. Germany then suddenly they see the press I'm sorry, release I go by. Ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's I okay. Ahead. Gosh. No, no, no I, it's ridiculous. Germany jumps up <laughs> and says, "Oh, we'll take care of this for you." Yeah, who wants to volunteer? Oh, oh. Oh, Germany. Germany is like horseback in. in the back of the room. Oh, please. Oh, let us get them. Let us get them. 
Germany decides. Germany jumps up and says, hey, we'll arrest Netanyahu if you need somebody. Because we have some experience with arresting yeah. Jews. We We're got really that. We'll take care of him. Well, we got a place to put him while we wait, you know. Yeah. Maybe Germany should just shut up. Maybe maybe, maybe when just, it comes. To- yeah, maybe they should just take a thousand seats. Yeah. Okay. We're. We're told that we're told that Netanyahu and Israel are like conducting genocide, and Germany's like, "I'm sorry, did somebody say genocide? <laughs> are you kidding me?" Uh. So the German spokesperson said, "Of course they would arrest Prime Minister Netanyahu and and hand him over to the International Criminal Court if anything happened." Uh, un, un, unbelievable. Uh, that, by the way, anybody who's like on board with this and thinks this is a great development, that says everything. International Criminal Court Prosecutor Karim Khan equates a democratic government with Hamas, thereby demonizing and delegitimizing Israel and the Jewish people. He's completely lost his moral compass. Germany has a responsibility to readjust this compass, mm. uh, says uh, Ron Prosser, Israel's ambassador to Germany. Yeah, you think? The public statement that Israel has the right to self-defense loses credibility if our hands are tied as soon as we defend ourselves, which is exactly what they're trying to do to Israel. Yeah. Um, but leave it, leave it to Germany to not be able to really recognize their own history, and maybe they don't have the best moral standing to step up and, and, uh, and lead just the charge against Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah, just astonishing. Good thing is I don't think Netanyahu... Uh, is traveling to Germany anytime soon. Well, certainly not, really, not after yeah, this. But it really no. does tell you something, that they are the first to sort of volunteer in this brave role as uh, as as the country to arrest the sitting Jewish president. Oh, does a Jew uh, need to be arrested? We'll get him for you. We are very good at this. Uh, by the way, I just remember recalling having doing an interview with um, former ambassador to Germany, Rick Grinnell, where mm. it was like pulling teeth to get them to honor the sanctions against Iran. Yep. They were they were more than happy to do business with Iran. But, you know, the second the IC the, and the, this also sort of I mean, we can mock Germany all we want as well. We should. But the International Criminal Court is a corrupt organization connected to the U.N., which is a corrupt organization. The entire thing should be disbanded, and the United States should have nothing to do with it. But other than that, everything's going great there in the world of diplomacy. By the way, thanks for the Biden administration for jumping up on this and condemning it for how despicable it is. 753.